Awesome. Yeah, I just I don't want to, um, for the sake of the few people that might come in late, um, I don't want to hold up everyone that is here. So yes. if you, yeah, if you want to unmute or sorry, if you'd like to mute your screens, um, that's ideal just so there's no background noise. Um, and if uh, you need to, you can always jump in and um, unmute or put your hand up and ask a question and we can go from there. Um, welcome everybody to HR Prime's first webinar. Um, HR Prime's been around for about four years, um, but uh, we're, we're starting to get, especially with the, the times being what it is and not being able to go out and visit our clients, um, we're starting to reach out in different ways, and this is going to be the first of a series. Um, obviously, the initial webinars that we do um, will be around COVID-19. That seems to be what's on everybody's mind, and rightfully so. Um, I try, we try to model our, our webinars that we provide some high-end in, um, information and get through it relatively quickly. Um, we've found in the past um, with other types of things that we tried out that the Q&A period is the most beneficial thing for everybody. So um, we'll, we'll try and get to that. Um, this this module, this webinar, begging your pardon, was designed to give you an idea of what our on-call program looks like. So, and essentially, a lot of the questions that we've put in to this webinar are the questions we're being asked as expert um, advisors, um, health and safety, and um, HR. Um, and uh, that's it. So let's get started. Oh, there's a little more icons that pop up. Hey. So to start, your hosts, um, there's me, myself. Um, I'm Darcy, I'm the CAO of uh, HR Prime. You'll see Tar Heel. He is in fact a certified human resource dog and mascot. Um, I put him up here as a co-host because working from home, there is the potential opportunity that Tar Heel might chip in at some point. He's kind of opinionated that way, um, got that from me. Um, and then also, uh, this will just remind everyone that is on this call and is not already an on-call um, member with HR Prime, that one of the things that we're trying to do to support our community is um, our HR and health and safety community is provide everybody that's on this call with a 30-day trial of our unlimited HR um, HR and health and safety support. So basically it's call and email as many times as you like, um, as many times as you need um, for the duration of 30 days. And then uh, we'll reach out to everyone after this is over to, uh, to extend the details. So webinar outline, um, there is a pane for questions and answers. So please do feel free to submit your questions throughout. Um, the webinar. If we don't get in the Q&A, if we don't get to them, um, we'll respond to everybody um, with, the, with the answers to their questions. This webinar will also be, is also being recorded and will be on our website um, after, which will include the live Q&A session. We actually had about 10 or 12 questions come in prior to this, so we might not get to all of them. So the content we're discussing, as you've probably heard, if you've been on any other webinars, is not legal advice, and it, it's absolutely high end. It's a point in time summary. As all of you know that's on here, um, there is a year's worth of detail and material that's coming out every day. So it's, it's really um, chaotic and epic times as far as information and what that looks like. Um, we're gonna be discussing important considerations around layoffs, leaves, and ultimately what would turn out to be a termination. Uh, medical notes, we just have one slide to that regard, but it's important because there still are some employers that are asking questions about what medical notes look like and what might be the new normal. Um, employment rights and obligations for both the employer and employees as they relate to COVID-19. And again, we did that in a question format, the type of questions we're getting from our employers. And work, remote work arrangements and related issues in regards to COVID-19. So layoffs, there's many details to consider with layoffs. The actual, the, the language of what a layoff is and how it's written in the ESA is actually quite straightforward, but the actual implementation is a little bit more complicated than that. And a lot of that is um, due to legal considerations. So the first thing, and I'm sure all of you have heard about this already, whether it be from HR experts or legal experts, what have you, a layoff may in fact result in a claim of constructive dismissal by your employees. And what that means basically is when someone starts up in a white collar job or something or the other, outside of things that are seasonal like fisheries or construction, et cetera, et cetera, a layoff is not a reasonable or expected term of employment. So when you're laid off from your work, it is a substantial and material change. So unless you have something in your employment agreement or you are one of those industries, like I said, seasonal construction, et cetera, where a layoff might be a reasonable expectation of employment, when you go to lay off an employee, that employee can turn around and claim constructive dismissal, which in essence, if proven to be true, 
is the same as a termination and termination pays would be owing if the constructive dismissal claim was successful. One of the things I've advised my employer, my clients to do um, if they are concerned about this is simply to ask your employee if you put it to them that we have the option of either terminating you or laying you off, quite often the employee will take the layoff and that provides you with some sense of security that there won't be a constructive dismissal claim to follow. Um, the term permanent layoff, just to get this out of the way, it's often misunderstood. I have people call me all the time and say, we're going to permanently lay off this employee. If you put permanent layoff on an ROE, that's a termination. A permanent layoff does not occur until the end of the layoff period, whether it be 13 or 35 weeks happens. And then that's when it's deemed to be a permanent layoff, which is again, a termination. An employee can actually give in a letter that says permanent layoff, ask for their, their, um, their termination obligations right there and then. So it's important to note that the ESA only provides for um, legislation around a temporary layoff, not a permanent layoff. Um, so as far as layoffs goes, the basics, um, the ESA provides for temporary layoff only, like I said. Um, there's, they could last up to 13 weeks. There's certain things that would trigger the ability to make it last out 35 weeks. Um, the most common is if you continue to provide employee eligible benefits. So that might be a copay or it might be 100% employer. But if you do continue to provide those benefits, your layoff can last up to 35 weeks. Notice of a layoff is not required, although if it's possible, it's the right thing to do for your employees. Um, you, you don't have to provide any money. This is a big misnomer that you have to provide, that you have to pay out their vacation pay um, before they go on layoff. That's not the case. No money is owed whatsoever. However, on the other end, when you actually do go to call back your employees, that is, that is required to be provided in writing and reasonable notice should be provided. So a question I often get um, is what is reasonable notice? For me, reasonable notice is usually a week, but could extend up to two weeks. And the reason that would be two weeks is simply because other employees might find alternative employment rather than go on EI during the period of time when they're laid off. So when you go to bring them back, it's the right thing to do to provide them with a couple of weeks to be able to give them notice to their alternative employer. There's also things like childcare obligations and considerations as well, or care for other individuals, which has to be accounted for when you provide the notice. At the end of the applicable layoff period, so if you don't bring them back after the respectable 13 or 35 weeks, the employment relationship is considered to be terminated. At that point, the term permanent layoff is appropriate. Um, there are obligations that come with termination are due. So for people that are, they're of the opinion that are not familiar with common law, and I suspect that most people on this call are, um, the common law provisions still are enforced, so the common law obligations, begging your pardon, still are enforced if at the end of 13 weeks, someone is terminated, you would owe them what they're owed, whether that be terminate pay in lieu of termination notice. No notice is required, by the way. So it would just be you would owe them what they're owed, so the pay in lieu. And we're hopeful, this goes back to the claim of constructive dismissal, we're hopeful that the courts will be empathetic to employers in this, this time of consideration. If it's a case of force majeure or AKA act of God, um, then in cases like that, we're expecting or hoping, at least highly hoping, that the courts would suggest that that would be a, um, a sufficient reason to lay somebody off or terminate them in the end. Um, but at, as it stands, there's some lawyers out there that maintain that the rule for constructive dismissal is simple and the circumstances don't matter. Um, but civil law being what it is, they're, they're, they're not bound by precedent. They rely on precedent, but circumstances can be considered. It's not like criminal law where the letter of the law is what it is. That's all it is. So we're hopeful that at the end of the day, um, you're going to see a lot of constructive dismissal claims in front of judges over the next few months. We're hopeful that um, the courts will consider this extenuating circumstances and be kneeling on employers. So protected leaves, um, this, is, this is what's formatting the most of the questions. Layoffs is a lot of questions, but protected leaves, when somebody can actually go on a leave and when they can refuse is, is kind of a big thing right now. So these are the jobs that are protected and they're, if they're protected, in, so it's a medical leave, um, I believe the term is, um, well, anyways, we'll get to it. Um, then they, the week waiting period for EI is waived. So the requirement for isolation, an example of the requirement for isolation would be after traveling, um, someone has been diagnosed with COVID-19 or is displaying symptoms, and that's even if it's minor. So if even if someone has symptoms that would be associated with the cold, um, the employee and the employer does have rights they can advocate for in that case, and we'll get to that in a second. 
um, the need for childcare due to reasons associated with COVID-19. So if you have a, if you're looking after uh, your, your son or daughter and because their school was closed or their daycare was closed or et cetera, et cetera, the new fund will allow for you to apply for that. And it is also job protected. Um, the need to care for an individual that has been impacted by COVID-19. And this is important. Um, I've had, it's actually some of the questions that came up in the Q&A already. Um, these leaves are medical, so they're not due to a lack of work. If you're laying someone off for a lack of work, the week waiting period still applies for EI. If you're waiting for the medical, then the week waiting period does not apply. The important part here is an employee can change their status if laid off of work for lack of work, they can change your status to a medical leave at any point. Why is that important? Because when you lay off somebody for lack of work, that 13 week piece or the 35 week piece applies. If someone changed their status to, if they call you up and say, listen, I have COVID-19, then you as the employer are obligated to submit a, some amended ROE to change their status to on a medical leave, which means their job is protected. So there's a big difference and you should make your employees aware of that. So medical notes, and I put in there the new normal, that's just my term, just the way I see it, I suppose. Um, employers are not permitted to request medical notes for employees claiming to suffer from COVID-19. Um, a little bit of a caveat, um, and this is an opinion, um, employers should not be requiring medical notes for any illness. And what I mean by that is the symptoms that are synonymous with COVID-19 are similar to that of a bad cold or the flu. So if someone, you wouldn't know that they have, when they're asking people to self-isolate, if they have the symptoms, they wouldn't necessarily be going to the doctor and you don't want them to be going to a doctor and they can't distinguish necessarily between what is COVID-19 and what is the flu. So it's the reasonable thing for employers to do in this age, not to ask for medical notes at all for any illness. Service Canada does not require a note to apply for sickness benefits. If you call up server, if you apply for EI and you say that you have symptoms of COVID-19, they're simply going to grant you your claim without proof. Returning to work, um, medical notes are not required still. However, I'm encouraging employers to use their own process or documentation. So for example, you, can, you have the right as an employer to ensure that the employee is telling you the truth because you're concerned about your other employees that are there and them not getting sick as well. If someone was off for 14 days, if they self-quarantined and they're ready to come back to work, you can provide them with a questionnaire, something along the lines of why were, what were the original symptoms that you were off for? Are you experiencing any other symptoms? Do you have any other symptoms that are synonymous with COVID-19? Have you been around somebody in your household that has had the symptoms of COVID-19? And you can even put an enforcement mechanism in there that says, you know, basically that you're attesting to everything that you've said in this statement upon condition of discipline up to and including termination. And it's absolutely the right thing to do. There's nothing preventing you um, in any privacy legislation or anything of that nature that would stop you from doing that. And for this reason, getting used to the new normal, I'm actually encouraging my clients to do it for this very reason that I expect, and this is a, 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 an educated guest with a little bit of experience behind me, that the use of medical notes as they have been in the past by employers will find its way to the curb. Um, when you look at the pressure that people are claiming is on the healthcare system, um, the kickback from medical associations, you might recall the former liberal government under Wynn said that for the 10 days that would be emergency leave that you're not allowed to ask for doctor's notes. Everything leading up to this has been the case with the COVID-19 and this entire pandemic, it's reasonable to assume that things are going to change. So it's a good idea to start using this time to look at your processes now about how you have employees attest to being off work, what processes you want to develop to make sure you get some type of proof or verification thereof. So employment rights and obligations. So these are literally the questions that our clients have been asking. And these are four of the questions that have been about the top of the list from employees. So the first, um, can I send an employee home? So what we're finding right now is in this, I, I would like to say this is the most off question. What we're finding right now is employees are scared. Um, and employers need to be empathetic of that. But on the other hand, there's a lot of employers that are depending on these employees to show up for work because they still need to make money, run their business, et cetera, et cetera. So the employer is obligated to provide a safe workplace per the health, Occupational Health and Safety Act. What that means basically is that if you have a risk of COVID-19 or like a risk in front of you that you, it's a known hazard, not a potential hazard, but a known hazard, then you have to make sure that you eliminate said risk. The public health um, 
kind of standards about washing your hands, staying 10 feet apart, et cetera, et cetera. That's also expected you of a workplace. You pretty much can't go into any um, commerce place nowadays and not see whether it be shields or lines on the floor. Even in a workplace, which would be an industrial establishment, you're starting to see people that might have had 10 machines running only run five. So there could be distance in between each one of the machines. These are the obligations of the employer and the employee does have the right to refuse work without retribution should the employer not be doing any of these things. That said, provided the employer is doing what they're supposed to, there's no symptoms of COVID-19 or illness in general by the employee, anyone in the plant, anyone around them in the office, what have you, then technically that employer needs to be, that employee needs to be returning to work. What happens if the employee doesn't return to work? That's a gray area. Um, that can range anywhere from just putting them on an unpaid leave and putting on their ROE that they've t decided to self-isolate but are not symptomatic um, or going down the disciplinary route, which I don't recommend, but I have some employers that are doing that, just that thing. Can an employee refuse work? So I've kind of answered the one question kind of rolled into the other. Again, the employees have the right to refuse work if the workplace is unsafe or they feel that they're in danger. So the risk of COVID-19 is in fact a hazard, but that just having the fear of COVID-19, if the workplace is doing all that they're required to do, and there's no one that is exhibiting symptoms, including the person who's in fear or wanting to refuse work, then in a case like that, they're just as much as risk as they were if they were to go in a grocery store, which people still have to do. So communication is absolutely critical in situations like this. I know I had an employer just this morning that is going through this process right now um, and is going down the disciplinary route because the person is acknowledged when asked twice that they have no symptoms, they have no one at home they need to look after, there's no one that they're caring for, they just don't wanna leave their house. So because that's where they are, um, again, I don't recommend it. Um, the government's been pretty hard, heavy handed on employers that are acting in a, in a, in a punitive way against these employees, but um, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's a gray area, but it, it, I, I would encourage understanding by employers in this time. Um, employer, and there's the, the point made in big red letters. Employers should be accommodating as possible in circumstances like this. So do I have to pay the employee if I send them home? So this is an interesting question because it has some human rights implications. You do not have to pay the employee if you send them home for health and safety reasons. However, the latest ruling or the latest paper put out by the Ontario Human Rights Commission basically went so far as to say that if you can provide work at home, so if you are a company that can provide work at home and the employee is able to do said work at home, that you have to provide it or they're entitled to the usual pay. So the thing about the Ontario Human Rights Commission is they deliver these papers and they deliver these opinions. In the end, it'll be the tribunal which will decide whether or not um, the employer is guilty of violating someone's human rights, or in this case, their duty to accommodate. Um, but typically when the Interior Human Rights Commission puts out a paper like this, this is what the governing body or disciplinary body will be looking at. So the long story short, um, if you can provide accommodation, the Ontario Human Rights Commission has pretty much said it's your obligation to allow people to work from home or you're technically just, you know, not you're, you're violating your rights under the code. So a couple things to keep in mind, um, employees who take a protected leave are still retitled to benefits. They are able to use your sick time and vacation pay if eligible. So if they have sick time under your company plan or they have vacation, unused vacation pay coming to them, they're able to use that, but that's a conversation that you should be having with your employee because it could prejudice against the timing or time in which they would get employment insurance from Service Canada. If an employee's family member has come in place or come in contact with COVID-19, what do you do and what can you do? So the theory of reasonability comes into play here. Um, obviously, you'll have, you have policies in place, you'll have practices that you've followed. Just because someone has come in contact with someone that has COVID-19 does not necessarily mean that they have COVID-19. That said, Public health has recommended that anybody who comes into contact with COVID-19, a family member, someone they've been hanging around with, et cetera, et cetera, do the careful thing and self-isolate. Coming into someone with COVID, coming into contact with someone with COVID-19 um, carries the same weight for EI purposes as showing symptoms. So, or caring for someone that's showing symptoms. So, um, 
me personally, um, my HR opinion, um, if a client called is that I would encourage that employee to self isolate. If they didn't want to self isolate, you can, you know, revert back to your right as an employer to keep the workplace safe and make it. So, um, that way you're ordering the worker to be home so they can collect the eye. Um, but obviously you're going to, you, every employer is going to be a little bit different about how they judge that. It just goes back to the big bold note in red employers should be as accommodating. And I would add reasonable as possible. And of course, shameless self-promotion. Part of our on-call thing is that when you have these questions, again, these are questions that are coming from employers, call us. That's what we're here for. Um, we literally are spending hours every single day trying to keep up. And I can't say that we're all the way there. I don't think anyone is, but we're doing our best. And when employers call us, we try to give the best expert advice as we can. And again, with the on-call part of it, um, you can call as many times as you want and you don't have to worry about how much it's gonna call for each call. For each call, it's, you know, it's unlimited. It's just one-time cost, which is awesome. So working from home, and you'll see there, be sure to register for our next webinar. What we wanted to do was we wanted to provide an overview of some of the key topics, a high-end, fast overview of some of the key topics that are associated with COVID-19. I am still getting questions, as I'm sure my colleagues are, about layoffs and about you know, work refusals and what can we do and what can we do. So we decided to make sure that we did that, open it up to a larger Q&A session so we could hear what you want to hear about. But going forward, we're going to pick themes that are associated with COVID-19. So although the date has not been determined yet, within the next two to three weeks max, um, our next webinar will be on COVID-19, working from home and all the regulations and rules and possibilities, quite frankly, that go around that. So be sure to look on our website. We have a webinar tab, which will host all of our webinars that we do, as well as upcoming webinars as well. And hopefully you'll be hearing from other members of the HR Prime team who will be facilitating the webinars so you won't have to listen to my voice all the time or that of my mascot, wherever he is. So um, some of the things you have to keep in mind for your employees working from home, employers still have the duty to accommodate. I've already spoken to this, but I wanted to put it on the screen a second time. There is a greater obligation to accommodate during COVID-19 according to the Ontario Human Rights Code. So if you haven't had the chance or opportunity to read, to go on the um, Ontario Human Rights, um, Ontario, Ontario Human Rights site, if you have the chance to read it, um, it's actually quite enlightening. It gets, it's very straightforward. It gives you an idea of what is expected of you as an employer as it relates to accommodation and the right almost of employees to work from home if you can provide said accommodation. Your obligations under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, and that includes WSIB, remain. So the workplace is defined under the, as per the Occupational Health and Safety Act as any land, premises, location, thing, or thing upon in or near a worker works. So it's important to keep in mind that when you have workers working from home, things like um, keeping a safe work environment, ergonomics, proper lighting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are all things you need to be mindful of because just because they're working offsite does not mean your responsibilities as the employer are gone. Now, one of the things that, and this did come up in the Q&A, but it's an appropriate time to bring it up now. One of the things that was asked of me was a question around um, inspections and your Joint Health and Safety Committee and all that kind of jazz. The Ministry of Labor does not have the right to inspect a home office. However, you can work with your employees to work with the Joint Health and Safety representative or a member of your community, to, or committee, begging your pardon, to one, either have them come and do inspections, because inspections are still required, um, or two, get creative. So as much as we're on this webinar and we're doing this virtually, um, it's recommended for social distancing and all that kind of stuff. Maybe the person go around with the camera in their phone or just take a shot of their desk so the Joint Health and Safety representative can help them with ergonomics, proper lighting, proper seating, et cetera. Um, and you know, there's, there's different things you can do, but it's important to remember that when you're working from home, the workplace still extends to the home office. Workplace policies and procedures still do apply, although some require some adaptation. So I'm a big fan, even in regular times, not the pandemic times, of having a remote work policy. Um, it's important. Um, some of the policies that you're going to want to take a look at and remind your employees, even use this opportunity to retrain our policies around social media, about computer use, obviously privacy and confidentiality, which we'll get to. Um, but certainly one of the policies that I would encourage everybody to pay attention to, if you have policies around wellness, that's great, but your drug and alcohol policy. Um, 
you technically have the right to restrict the you, you technically have the right to provide the same restrictions to someone in their home office place as you do at home. So there can be an expectation that while someone's working from home, that they're not drinking all day. That aside, the wellness of your employees is, is obviously a big deal and a key consideration for everybody. And in these times, if you just have to look at the, the sales, the stats for the LCBO, which is up well over 100%. So um, these, these, are, these are difficult times for a lot of people, even people working from home, feeling a little bit isolated, um, social distance doubt. Um, so one of the things is good to provide refreshers for your employees is, is in fact, um, your drug and alcohol policy. Um, oops, sorry. Let's try that again. There's my technical difficulty for this slide or this webinar. And finally, and I think I mentioned it already, employers must be mindful of technology platforms and employees that what they're using on home, basically your privacy and confidentiality obligations remain. So whether it be PEPIDA or a specific policy, um, it's, you, you, you've heard about the thing going on with Zoom right now where they've inserted extra protections so people can't crash it. If you can imagine that people can get into a computer through a, you know, a multi-million dollar platform such as Zoom, you can imagine what those hackers out there right now are doing to your employees home so it's important to be mindful of that and again all of this will be talked about in greater detail um, in our next webinar so these are the actual questions that our clients have been asking um, what will the Ministry of Labor expect for remote workplaces with respect to managing COVID-19 so I think we've addressed that to the large extent um, that the work the rules for the workplace extend to um, to the home office, there is an expectation, I would say, that there would be more communication, that there would be ways that you could check in with your employees and ensure that their health and safety um, is taken into account. That's a due diligence piece. So other questions that we're getting, how do I manage the performance of home-based employees? Um, no true and tried an answer to this. Um, obviously technology being what it is, there's a lot of different ways to track your employees if that's what you're concerned with. Ultimately, at the end of the day, um, trust, communication, professionalism. Um, I, I, encourage, I encourage my employees to look at results and output. Um, if somebody can get something done, uh, when you look at a week, if someone wants to like, enjoys working from home in the morning, so they get up at six o'clock in the morning and they work till one, they're not the traditional nine to five because they don't have to be. As long as the output uh, and um, the, as long as the output's there, then I encourage employees to be fine with the pe way people want to work at home. Should we be concerned about an employee's bell being what about alcohol and drug abuse? Again, discuss that briefly. Um, obviously the policy should be in place. Your employees should be made aware of the policy. Um, it's something that you should potentially retrain on and remind them of. But at the end of the day, your first obligation is to make sure because it's not that you're not concerned about it all the time, but realistically, this is a time where those things can be more of a concern for employers. So it's important to communicate, reach out, um, encourage the use of EAPs if need, open door policy um, virtually, of course. But um, these are all things, again, um, that we just wanted to put out there um, and we'll touch base in our next webinar, um, but uh, a nice gentle overview. And we're to the questions and answers. Again, I tried to endeavor to get through that in about 20 to 25 minutes, a half hour, which gives us about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Um, I noticed there's a couple of questions that have come up. Um, so again, shameless self-promotion. These are the two promotions we have going on right now. Our on-call support program is $8.99 per year. That's always what it is. It's unlimited calls, unlimited emails. You get five custom documents and you get discounts and everything else. We just launched our brand new website and e-learning, interactive e-learning platform. It is awesome. Um, our one-click compliance, uh, take a look at it. It's everything that an employee needs to be onboarded. Right now, and this is very limited time, uh, we're offering you unlimited use of our one-click compliance. So if you have 100 employees for $595 for all of them, you can, have, you can train all of them unlimited for the, over the course of the year. So please do take advantage of that. And really quickly before we get to the Q&As, I just wanted to introduce our team. Um, Morris just joined us, Steve. Um, all of these guys are instrumental in helping put together the information for this webinar and the ones to come. Chris and Dan are our awesome senior HR health and safety consultants. Neil, who's been with me for some time now. Uh, Benjamin, who is a, I, what, can I say kick ass in a webinar? I guess I just did. Um, a uh, awesome uh, researcher and developer of modules. Um, Taylor, um, who's also helping us out with the consultant and content developing piece. And then of course myself. 
So on behalf of all of us, I'm glad that you attended this webinar. We're happy to take your questions now. Um, I'm gonna do some of the questions that came in prior to, in, in fairness to the people that emailed in, and then I'll get to the live questions and um, we can do that with your mic muted or you can put up your hand and ask the question if you like, whichever you prefer. Okay, so as far as the questions um, go um, that have been asked, um, I had a question from Grace who said, when people return to full business operations and require a full staffing complement, are people able to decline a return to work or are they required to return? So the answer to that would be that they're not required to return to work. Um, oftentimes people do find alternative employment and that's where they want to stay. Um, if at the time you offer them a reasonable period of time to return to work and they decide not to, the employment relationship is just deemed to be ended. There would be no money owing um, from the employer um, as it is the decision of the employee to leave the employee. Um, which followed a follow-up question from Grace. Um, their concern was in relation to the COVID-19 that when someone was called back from work, if they did not come back to work at that time because they needed to care for a child or a sick relative or what have you, um, what happens then is the employment relationship still ended. And the answer to that would be no. Um, at that point, you would switch them over to a infectious benefit infectious disease emergency leave which is a protected leave and then they would go on um, a, a medical leave which is unlimited in its duration um, likely to be the time and stint that would be before child uh, daycares and schools and all that kind of open or at least to the summer um, another question we had was can we force an employee to take vacation time before layoff um, again common misnomer that you have to pay a vacation time before layoff that's not the case can you force someone to take a vacation before layoff? The answer is yes, um, with the caveat of why would you want to. Um, it's really difficult on the employee um, to make them take vacation. It could extend out their time that they're eligible to apply and receive EI, so it's not the best thing to do in the world. And in certain cases, depending on past practice, depend and depending on how much vacation time you're asking them to take, it could lead to a claim of constructive dismissal. So if you've never had a practice in the past, of dictating when vacation time would be taken. Um, that is a material change in the working relationship. So it could get you in some hot water. Um, the thing to consider, I, I think in a case like that is to talk to your employee. Um, some employees, some employers I've encouraged to do this, have talked to their employee and their employee has said that yes, I have two weeks paid vacation coming to me. I would like to be able to take that two weeks paid vacation and get my 100% income so I can kind of squirrel some away in preparation for the next however long I'm going to be on EI. So if the employee makes the decision because it's good for them, it's a great thing to do for the employer. But if the employee is forced to make that decision, there's some liability you can get in. It's not the best thing that could happen for your employee. It's actually not the nicest thing to do. Um, and you could get to yourself and uh, some, some, some hot water there. So uh, next question, uh, what happens after an employee reaches their maximum time of layoff? What are the employer's remaining obligations? And the answer to that is you would owe them termination pay. Um, you would owe them common law consideration if applicable. Um, hopefully people are laying off junior people and not their most senior people. The risk with laying off your most senior people, even though it's a greater cost savings, is when you do get to the point where you're negotiating your termination package, common law will absolutely be a consideration, especially because you forego the layoff of junior people for senior people. So something to be mindful of. Um, your, as far as your obligations go past that, you have none. They are no longer an employee. Um, a follow-up question I had to that was, can you rehire them or can, they, can you extend their recall? Of course. So there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with letting, if you have to let someone go um, because you had no work at the end of 13 weeks, another 10 weeks down the road, if you now have work of bringing them back and, and hiring them in, in, in good faith. So, and I think the last question that I had that I was wanted to answer, can an employer insist on a negative test result for COVID-19 prior to returning them to the workplace? Um, and that's a tricky one. Um, it's more of a human rights question than anything else. Um, my answer would be no. Um, I like the idea of the questionnaire um, that you know says that you don't have any of the symptoms or anything of that nature. The reason it's partially a human rights issue is no different than why drug testing and alcohol testing is a human rights issue. 
there's no test out there that's 100% that could say that COVID that you are infected with COVID-19 or you're not. Most of the tests have some degree of error. So if you were to insist on a test, which would require someone going back to a doctor's office and putting more people at risk, including themselves, um, that would technically be, in my opinion, um, unresponsible. So, um, but teach their own. So I'm going to, it looks like there's a lot of questions. Um, okay, so um, just looking at some of the questions here, um, uh, Dan Ant opened up and said, will the government likely amend the ASI related to layoff language? Um, obviously, we don't know what the, the state of the mind of the government is. Um, they've already done some amendments as far as um, you know, things like uh, waiving the waiting period for um, the work share programs. They've waived the waiting period for that and extended the length of time that a work share program can go. So the, it, it's likely that the government will respond in kind where they can. Um, part of the problem, quite frankly, with the government amending things is actually getting into a room to do it. So you've seen that, you know, important, you know, important government legislation around grants and things of that nature um, have been held up because they've had to get people in the same room and have been unable to do it virtually. So um, I think it'll come in time. I don't think the work world will be the same after COVID-19 as it's not. So I think that there will be specific language around pandemics and medical emergencies as it relates to ES, as the ESA and layoffs going forward. Um, Another question, uh, medical notes. What about workplace existing policies that require medical notes? At this point, you would just scrap them. Um, the normal that was is no longer the normal is now. And I really encourage my clients to think this way is we're not in normal times acting the way you would in normal times. Sometimes could be libelous or irresponsible. So if you do have a what do you call it, a, a policy that requires doctor's notes, you're going to need to shelf that. I know that a few of the um, unionized um, employers that I have um, that have still maintained um, as per their CA, the requirement for medical notes that the union is outright grieved in and refused to provide medical notes. And the, in both cases that that's happened, my, my employer is back down, which is important. So uh, another question from an anonymous attendee, <laughs> can an employer continue to ask for doctor's notes for reasons other than COVID-19? So I answered that in, in my, um, in my presentation. Um, if it's anything to do with an illness, I suggest and recommend that you do not. Um, the government, public health is saying the same thing. Most doctors, and this is the predicament that you are in right now, most doctors that I've talked to or been associated with, because I do have a arm's length relationship with some of the medical community as, 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 it, as it relates to accommodations and things of that nature, are refusing to provide medical notes at all. So even if it's something where you could, the likelihood of you getting it and it being of you know, substance to you is, is nil to slim. So I, I, would, I would suggest best practice would be to um, not ask for medical notes for illnesses at this time. Um, Anna um, asked the question, with most businesses closed and companies are forced to lay all employees off, do you anticipate legislation to change if state of emergency is not lifted within 13 weeks? Do you anticipate legislation to make accommodation that companies don't have to terminate if it's after the 13 week window? Um, again, to reiterate the, the answer that I gave to Dan, I can't be certain. Um, the people that I've talked to in my senior HR circles, um, who again, arm's length connection with some of these lawmakers, have suggested that um, not unlike in unionized environments, the right to extend a recall, um, the, so the employee to extend their own recall right, um, rather than take the termination pay, um, that that's, that's, a, that's a thing, that's something that's being discussed. So if you're not familiar with that in most unionized environments, um, if there is a layoff, and it's almost entirely always 35 weeks because benefits are extended, at the end of the 35 week period, the employee has the right to waive the termination pay and extend their layoff. So again, that means that they're continuing to be employed. It's enforceable in a unionized environment because when you have somebody laid off, it's very difficult unless there's really wild reasons to hire somebody else until you bring the person back that was laid off. So it's to a benefit to those people to have it extended. So I, through my circles, I've been informed that, um, what do you call it? Um, that is something that the government is looking at is giving the employees the right to extend their benefit, to, to extend their recall period. Um, another question about the slides. Yes. The entire presentation will be made available on our website. So if you would like, um, my email address is darcy at hrprime.ca. 
So I don't know if that's up here or not. Bear with me for one second. Yes, so there's e-support as well. And one more person, there we go, Tar Heel. So you will be able to access all the slides um, on our website, but if you'd like me to send you out the deck, um, by all means, just send us an email and then we'll send you out a copy of the PowerPoint, not a problem. Okay, please review the notice and severance obligations with the temp LO converts to permanent. That's Steve. Uh, Steve, can you actually type in the answer? I don't necessarily understand the question, I'm sorry. So we'll, we'll have to come back to that. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> Uh, John, uh, John is a client of mine, so um, I, I'm getting this answer, getting this question to you an hour later. Um, if you have no company money left at the end of the layoff, how do you negotiate a termination package? Um, difficult. Um, we're hoping that there's going to be some, you know, it, it's funny because a lot of questions have been asked about what the government is going to do or not going to do. And I think that's ever continuously evolving. I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on the government because they're kind of equating when layoffs have started and they know. Um, that's basically the layoffs have started, you know, two, three weeks back ago, sometimes in the cases of four weeks ago. I think as we get closer to that 13 week mark, um, the government is going to come up with some type of funding or exemption or something or the other, maybe to allow you to defer um, your termination pay. But at this point, at this point, like real time, your obligation is to provide the minimum. So whatever the ESA states, if someone had been there for less than a year, but over three months, than to provide a week's pay in lieu of notice. If they have been there for over three years, then three years weeks pay in lieu of notice. Your obligation is still to provide a minimum to keep in standing um, with the ESA. That does not mean or doesn't preclude the, the employee from suing you for wrongful dismissal. Um, and what wrongful dismissal in a case like that is very misunderstood. So the term wrongful dismissal, when you give somebody what is the ESA minimum, is not saying that you did something wrong when you terminated them. It's saying that they are unhappy or they feel that the amount of money that you're providing them, which is the minimum, is insufficient for them to fund themselves while they find equal or comparable employment. So you can't stop that from happening, um, but at, at the minimum right now, uh, shot, a t shot in time, right now you would have to pay the minimum as per the ESA. Um, explain how to deal with notice and severance when the 13, 35 week period, well, there you go. So same type of question. Um, you, you have, it, it's no different than when you're terminating another employee. The hope is that as far as common law goes, um, that the courts will be somewhat more understanding of that. So at the end of 13 or 35 weeks, you are obligated to reach out to your employee and let them know that they have been terminated, um, uh, just lack of work. Um, it, you, you can use the term at this point, it would be correct to say permanently laid off. Um, based on their years of service, um, they would be owed their payment in lieu. Um, should they have been there for more than five years and your payroll is more than $2.5 million, then in addition to their payment in lieu, you would owe them their severance pay, um, which is one week per year, plus any partial year up to a maximum of 26 weeks. And then for longer term employees, executive employees, the things that you would consider when determining your common law package, which typically are how long have they been there? How much money do they make? Um, really what it comes down to in a nutshell is their ability to find comparable employment. Um, that's what you have to determine. There, there's two sides to that argument as, as I see it anyways. On the one side, it's gonna be incredibly more difficult to find comparable employment for employees that were making a fair bit of money in this, in this world we live in right now. So that would suggest that a, a judge might look at that and say, okay, well, this person is entitled to more money because it's going to take them more time to find comparable employment. On the other hand, you would like to think that a judge would look at the circumstances and say it was through no fault of the employer that this crisis happened. They had to lay off an employee and at the end of it, they still had no work. So until we get to that point, we have no idea. It's like I mentioned in one of the first slides, um, we can only hope that the, that the, the I guess the judicial, the judicial powers to be are understanding and empathetic of employers in this time. Um, but the last time this happened, I believe it was 10, 12 years ago, um, when we had a financial crisis and we had a tremendous amount of people that were laid off and then given packages at the end of it, the courts were not very understanding at all. So that gives credence to the people out there that would say the law is the law is the law. This is what is constructive dismissal. This is what constitutes common law consideration. And that's what it's going to be. But we can only hope for something different than that. 
Um, question from Jennifer. Great last name, by the way. Um, I have a remote office that currently only has two employees operating. Are there any health and safety concerns to consider if one of those employees required to work from home for daycare or illness, leaving only one employee working in the office? So I just, let me just read that again really quick. Okay. So I, it, it, it sounds like the two employees are working from the same place. Um, I'm not certain. Typically, if someone is at home, and this is this is kind of a reasonable expectation, if someone's at home and they're working from home, there's supposed to be a latitude that that person would be able to look after their kids. As far as health and safety concerns, one of the things I've been recommending, and it's funny because someone just posted a thing yesterday about uh, claiming a workplace harassment against their cat. Um, one of my clients reached out to me about that, asking if we had a policy. <laughs> but I, I typically advise clients to advise their employees that are working from home to have their own workspace. So it's great if you have your own office. Awesome. But if not, whether it be pulling the kitchen table into a corner, whether it be having a baby gate. So this our area of the home is for home and this area of the home is for work. As long as you encourage and ensure that your worker is keeping the workspace where they are safe then you're fine. It's an unreasonable expectation, whether it be of the Ministry of Labor to a lesser extent WSIB, because there are, there's more WSIB considerations with that question than there are um, health and safety questions. But it still is an unreasonable expectation that all of your home outside of your work area um, would be subject to the same standard that would be your work area. So I think that's all of the questions that were in the Q&A portal. I'm just gonna go on the chat and see if there's anything there. Okay, so I think that's it. Does anybody, oh, sorry, employee laid off prior to COVID-19 with recall period falling within current mandatory non-essential business closure, ability to extend as of COVID. Um, as it stands right now, so basically, if I understand the question you're asking, um, Sarah, is if they come back um, if they to be recalled within the non-essential business closure period, um, is their ability to extend the la temporary layoff provisions as per the ESA? I, to reiterate an answer earlier, as it stands now, not that I'm aware of. Um, that doesn't mean, again, with the information coming so quick, I can't guarantee I'm 100% right. I will certainly make sure for you. But as it stands right now, um, the rules around layoff are the same. Again, I expect that as we get closer to that 10 to 13 week mark from when layoffs were really happening at a rampant pace in Ontario, that there will be um, changes or considerations for that very question or scenario that you're asking. But as it stands right now, um, that would be it. So, but I, I, I will certainly follow up. And uh, if, if my answer is different from the one I gave you, then I will make sure all the people on this um, call are made aware via email. So looking, oh, a couple more questions. Okay, holy folks, you guys are fast. <laughs> um, just so you know, it's 11.52. Um, I'll stay on the line and answer any of these questions that anyone has. For anybody that has to go because they were on their 45 minute schedule, I just wanted to say thank you um, for um, participating in our first um, webinar. Um, I really appreciate you guys coming out. We're happy to do this for you. Um, make sure you look for our ones coming forward. We will reach out to you to see if this was of value to you and also to find out what it is that you want from us in webinars going forward. So we would like to be your trusted expert source for information and um, we, we appreciate you looking for us for that reason. So um, thank you. Um, so back to the questions. I'll answer as many as I can um, as they keep on coming up. If your organization is closed due to them being deemed a non-essential business, can you have core staff working security maintenance? Um, the question as far as, as far as I understand is no. Um, if you're closed, then you're closed. It does not mean you can't provide e-learning um, or sorry, e-commerce. It does not mean that you can't provide, um, uh, what would you say? Um, the things like they're doing, the, the, people working from home and things like that. You could still run your business provided you do not have contact with the public. So I guess in, in a vein, in the same vein, if your security and maintenance people are not in contact with the public um, and are following all the public rules, so in other words, you're not doing the business, you're just maintaining your, your, your building or your business, um, I would suppose that technically uh, you're fine. 
Um, but again, um, actual doing business can only be done via e-commerce or via work, people working from home, um, is my understanding. Um, can you, uh, Steve asked the question, can you speak to the increased trend of domestic violence and how companies can deal with it? Um, I'm going to leave, if this is okay with you, Steve, I'm going to leave that question for our next webinar. Um, there's a lot, there, there was a couple of really good articles that were written on, written on that subject this week. Um, and it's a big issue. Um, and in fairness to everybody on this call, um, including myself being prepared and providing this information to you, um, this is something I want to dig in a little bit deeper so I can provide you with the best answer possible. So it's a great question. Um, we will absolutely address it in our next webinar and I hope everyone tunes in for that. And thanks, Steve. Um, essential workers and requests for leaves. So again, it goes back to the reason why they're requesting the leave. Um, if they're requesting the leave because they're fearful, um, then the, it's the work refusals things come into play. Um, at the end of the day, um, if you are an essential business, and uh, business outside of you having to follow the, the rules around, um, what do you call it? Social distancing and public health and all that kind of stuff. It's business as usual as far as whether you want to grant leaves or not. So if you say, okay, we're in a position where we need you here, so we simply can't grant the leave as an employer, that's your right. If it's something that's a, a, a leave around um, the protected leaves, um, then as an employer, you don't have a say. Um, in other words, if you are in a, if I, I had a question from a client a couple of days ago that they requested a leave to be able to look after their kids um, and the, it requested to be laid off in essence. And the employer said no. And in fact, the, the response to the client was that uh, you have to allow for that. If that person is in a position where they have to look after their kids because of closures that are due to COVID-19, that is now a protected leave. Not only do you have to allow the leave, but you have to make sure that that leave, that job is waiting for that person when they come back. It's a protected leave. So, and then question from Carol. And Carol, I might reach out to you directly on this um, because you're asking about workers' compensation, um, not WCIB. So I think, you're, I think that's a BC question. And this was an Ontario-based um, thing. Um, what if employee is on WCB prior to layoff? Um, because it's jurisdiction based, um, I'll reach out to you personally, um, either this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Carol's a client, by the way, um, a great client at that. Um, so I'll reach out and we'll get that question answered for you. Um, and then Carol, again, <laughs> notice a recall, refused to have doing, have to, refused due to having to take public transportation to work. Um, excellent question. I'm actually really glad you asked that. I'm surprised it hasn't been asked already the the legal opinion on this to date and again legal opinions are in fact that just because i'm a senior hr person or a person's an employment lawyer a lot of what we're talking about is still opinion based the the legal opinion to date is that public transportation the fear of getting it on public transportation does not give sufficient reason for someone to refuse work so at this point the actual bus like bus routes and that type of transportation has deemed to be essential. And there's actually people doing that job, taking the bus to get to work is, is considered to have the same risk, which means you can take a bus to get to work. And that's not a reason to refuse. Um, at the end of the day, it'll be the, the first person that I'm sure it's already happened. Um, it's just obviously the ministry of labor is not going to be able to commute every single case to us in real time. But in essence, um, the process for work refusal is to, you know, say, here's the hazard. The employer looks into it, does their investigation in terms of whether or not it's a hazard or not. If they deem it not to be a hazard, then you reach out to the ministry of labor. The ministry of labor is going to make that call. So um, from what I understand to date, the call on that is that no, that does not, provide for a reason for which you can make a valid work refusal. So that's all the questions. That was a lot. It's about 12 o'clock. So, and I'm losing my voice and Tar Heel hasn't chimed in. He's being very patient. I appreciate that. So um, for everybody, um, I'm going to end the webinar now. If anybody has any questions that did not get answered or you want answered, or you think of after this webinar, by all means, email in to us. We're happy to answer those questions for you. And for those people who already don't have um, on-call, 
you're going to be given the 30 days on call for free anyways. So you'll have plenty of time and plenty of opportunity and access to one of the experts on the screen to be able to have those questions answered. So thank you everybody for coming out. Um, it was a joy being able to present to you all. And on behalf of all of my team that you see up on the screen, um, be careful, be safe, and we'll see you next time.